Welcome to Fibroid Summit 2023, Focus on Research. Our annual Fibroid Summit program was developed to share emerging fibroid and menstrual research with our community. The summit is unique because it is hosted by patients and because most of the questions come from patients who have lived the unique lived experience of managing fibroids and in many instances having undergone treatments. When women are diagnosed with fibroids, they have simple questions. What are fibroids? What caused the fibroids? What are the treatment options? Will they come back? And what can I do to prevent them from returning? To a degree, some of these questions can be answered, but sadly, there is still so much that can't be answered. Fibroids are prevalent, answers are needed, and research is critical. Over the next two days, we are going to focus on research. Please click on the chat pop-up and ask questions during the presentation. After each presentation, we will ask the researcher your questions, so you'll have an opportunity to hear your question addressed in real time. I'd like to introduce Dr. William Catherino. Dr. Catherino is a professor and chair of the research division of the Department of Gynecological Surgery and Obstetrics at the F. Edward Hebert School of Medicine at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences. And he is a member of the Fibroid Foundation's Medical Advisory Board. After the interview, Dr. Catherino will join me for a live question and answer segment. Welcome, Dr. Catherino. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to present some of our work. I'm just going to say right off the bat that a lot of this work is kind of basic and translational science, and I'll walk you through and make sure that it's clear what I'm trying to say. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us and make sure that we answer your questions. The reason for the, the uh, um, disappearing picture to your right is to show that these are actually fibroids that have been removed from a uterus. And my hope is that one day we won't have to do this anymore because we will be able to treat these fibroids before they become such a problem that patients have to undergo surgery. So our goal here is to identify the near future of novel fibroid treatment. Um, as you may know, fibroids uh, get, become progressively worse with the increasing incidence over age, and they also have a, um, a higher prevalence among patients, uh, women of African descent. As you can see in the red line, the uh, incidence rate per 10,000 person years dramatically increases, but for all women, uh, if, you, if there is a uterus, there is a chance that you're going to end up developing uterine fibroids, and it's important to be aware of that, that this is a widely uh, diverse and highly prevalent disease. In addition, as you can see on the bottom, by age in the bottom and cumulative incidence, meaning the percentage of women uh, evaluated, that over time, while it does uh, increase at a more rapid rate among patients of African descent, by the end of the reproductive year, 70 to 80% of all women will have identifiable fibroids. Now, in many cases, those fibroids won't be symptomatic, but it's important to be aware that they exist. And we'll talk a little bit about that specifically shortly. It's also important to realize the prevalence of this disease relative to other diseases. In a lot of cases, people don't really get a sense of how common fibroid it is or when we discuss it and discuss how important it is. But when you're looking at an overall prevalence of all patients or all individuals evaluated, the likelihood of developing lyomyomas is in the same likelihood, at least as developing hypertension, asthma, diabetes, maybe even more. And then you have higher uh, incidence and higher prevalence disease processes. But many that we focus on and we put a lot of effort into to better understand actually impact a lower number of patients in the in our population and it's important to recognize that we a lot of many people are suffering from uterine fibroids and yet our efforts to try to address this have been stunted in many ways and we've had a lot of challenges along the way but currently we're making uh, great progress so if, if for a patient who has fibroids identified roughly one in four of them are going to have symptoms significant enough to bring them to uh, require clinical intervention but what do you do for the young woman who has an identified fibroid but has no symptoms whatsoever? Well, 
she's likely to be asymptomatic for a period of time. It's unclear exactly how long, but depending on where the fibroid is located, depending on how many there are and other characteristics, um, the, there's an increasing chance of symptomatic uh, outcome. Once they, that those symptoms develop, then we have various therapies, and you may have heard from other lecturers and other speakers, uh, various therapies, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those as well, but none of these are really developed to delay or prevent the outcome of the patient or the woman who has a uh, asymptomatic fibroid. So the challenge is if you understand and know that you have fibroids, there's a stress that's involved in recognizing that at some point this will become symptomatic and potentially so symptomatic to require dramatic interventions. And yet right now we do not yet have something to provide for these women to be able to assist them and try to keep this fibroid at bay. Um, I'm going to be talking, for the most part, when we're talking about uterine fibroids, we usually evaluate various aspects of what the fibroids cause. Again, many patients are asymptomatic. However, the most common symptom that people will present with is heavy menstrual bleeding. They may also have pelvic pain, pelvic pressure, um, difficulty urinating or uh, stress urinating incontinence, dyspareunia, meaning a painful intercourse, dyschezia, painful bowel movements due to these fibroids and an impact on fertility or subfertility. Now I'm a reproductive endocrinologist. So a lot of my focus is on uh, fertility and subfertility, but I am not focused only on this. I'd like to rec recommend you to take a look at heavymenstrualbleeding.com as I represent the United States in a international collaboration, evaluating ways in which to deal with heavy menstrual bleeding, not just from fibroids, but certainly among women who are suffering from fibroids and have menstrual bleeding. I'm currently evaluating in the laboratory other potential causes of pelvic pain that may be associated with uterine fibroids. But today I'm gonna to be mainly focusing on the impact on fertility and subfertility. I just wanna make it clear that there are other areas that are of uh, import that are relevant to a wide range of people. And these are not, um, these are also under consideration and being evaluated as well. So for those with uterine fibroids, it's important to recognize that the risk of an abnormal outcome should a woman become pregnant is high. And I not only put the odds ratio, which is often mentioned as it's elevated over a patient without fibroids, but I also want to put in the actual percentages from these studies to show that a lot of women with uterine fibroids have outcomes that are suboptimal compared to their patients who have no uterine fibroids. And it's, as you're evaluating and looking at these numbers, they they are pretty dramatic. And it's a challenge to do these studies, as you can imagine, because it depends on what you mean by a fibroid. Is it the number of fibroids? Is it the size of the fibroids? Is it the location of the fibroids? And also based upon characteristics of the patient. Is the patient um, in her early 30s, late 30s, early 40s, early 20s, late 20s, um, those can all have an impact, but fibroids overall tend to have a negative outcome among, among patients who are attempting to deliver a child. In addressing how we look at various therapies, it's important to recognize what therapies exist and how long have we evaluated them. So I put here the surgical, radiologic, and medical options that we have, have had at our disposal over time. And as you can see, hysterectomy and myomectomy, especially where an incision is made in the abdomen, have been around for over 100 years. And so we know a lot about these interventions. We know that they can work for the treatment of uterine fibroids, and we know that they come with fairly substantial side effects associated with uterine fibroids. We developed uh, treatments like endometrial ablation and GnRH analogs to address different aspects of what we know about uterine fibroids. For, for example, with, en uh, with endometrial ablation, if the endometrium is completely destroyed, which is what this does, it burns away the endometrium, then the likelihood of having heavy menstrual bleeding goes away. However, it's not treating the fibroid, it's only preventing that heavy menstrual bleeding as best as it can. It may not even complete that uh, effort. So as a therapy, it's a quick therapy, but it may not necessarily be one that is, uh, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And it certainly isn't curative because it's not treating the fibroids. GnRH analogs are therapies that are used to decrease the exposure to, to hormones that come from the uh, gonads like estrogen and progesterone. 
And by doing that, it decreases the stimulatory effect on the of these hormones on these growths. That's how they work. So when you take them take these hormones away, the pyroids do tend to decrease in size. However, symptoms occur because you've given these medicines, including hot flashes, uh, potential loss of bone, other issues that may in the long term be a challenge for women who are suffering from uterine fibroids. And then I've listed other more recent therapies on this uh, chart to give you a sense of what's going on. I'd like you to evaluate them and recognize that they're not very well, um, they're not very complicated, right? Most of the therapies are focusing on either ways to deprive a fibroid of its nutrients, either by removing it with a hysterectomy, myomectomy, or to um, obstruct blood flow, urinary embolization, uh, urinary occlusion, um, to burn it or shrink it with cryomyolysis, with uh, high frequency ultrasound therapies, or to deprive it of hormones, which are the uh, progesterone receptor modulators, the estrogen receptor modulators, GNH antagonists or agonists. These various therapies all form the basis with which we our current therapies are built and they're not terribly complicated as far as uh, what we know about uterine fibroids. And ideally would like to know more so that we can have a better directed therapy. One point I always like to address here is there's an argument that hysterectomy is the solution to uterine fibroids. Once the uterus is out, a woman cannot develop any more uterine fibroids. To which I respond, well, then removing all some to removing someone's teeth is a cure to, to cavities. You'll never have a cavity again by taking the teeth out. You never have to worry about it again. Don't need to worry about braces. Don't need to worry about anything like that. But is that really cured? Is that really a solution? And I point out the fact that um, find me an organ anywhere in the body that is more miraculous than the uterus. It can grow to 50 times its normal size. It can support life. Then find me an organ treated with less respect. We talk about removing the uterus as if it's trivial. Once it no longer serves a function, remove it. If I asked a bunch of people to remove just the tip of their pinky and leave everything else along, leave the knuckle alone, everything like that, no one would sign up for this. But we're willing to do a, a major surgery to remove a essentially a major organ and treat this as if this is the, the right process. I think we can do better. And I think we will do better. There's been a... a transition over time in multiple fields, looking at how we move away from surgery. And I've just listed a couple here to address various ways in which we have moved from a surgical intervention to a non-surgical intervention. And we this these are just a few, I'm sure you could think of others. And ultimately these tend to be more patient friendly. As we remove the risks uh, and uh, complications associated with surgery and identify ways in which we can treat without surgery, we tend to have better outcomes and a far more satisfied person who is getting relief and isn't necessarily put at great risk. So I think these are just an example. These are a few examples of ways in which we should be constantly thinking about ways of solving the problems without requiring surgery. Now, this is always a challenge because when we go to funding agencies to discuss this, there's not a lot of interest in looking at diseases such as uterine fibroids. One argument is that they're not cancer. They don't metastasize. The patient isn't likely to die from the metastatic spread of uterine fibroids. That is true. They are not cancer. However, they're highly symptomatic and highly prevalent. So it's important to recognize the, the morbidity and suffering that a lot of women are undergoing. And they can be cured again, through hysterectomy, they can be cured. But again, is this the appropriate cure for such patients? And then one uh, argument that I've heard is that, well, there, there are women with fibroids who can have babies. So that's good enough. As long as there's at least one woman who can have a baby with uterine fibroids, then that means that fibroids aren't that big of a problem. Again, it depends on where the fibroids located, it depends on how many, the size of the fibroids, so there's a lot of women who have a lot of difficulty having babies. It's a lot of women who have heavy menstrual bleeding, have a lot of pelvic pain that are unrelated to these. And ultimately, one of the challenges we have is that there is no National Institute of Women's Health. We have a National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and that focuses on child health and human development in general. But there is no institute for women's health where we would address diseases that are unique to women, 
like menopause, like uterine fibroids, like endometriosis, that really don't fit in well with other areas. And this is an area where I think we could all work together to try to develop something that could result in an institute that specifically focuses on these issues instead of doing them uh, whenever we, whenever a institute happens to have some sort of interest in it or feels pressure to provide some support for it. All right, off my soapbox, let's move on. Let's talk about uterine fibroids. And what do we know about uterine fibroids? This is a picture here, and I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, but the cervix is down here. The uterus has been cut in half. And this big white world object represents the uterine fibroid. And as you can see, it can take up a lot of space within the uterus. It's clearly a different color. The, the red of the uterus may remind you of something like steak, which it should because it has that meat kind of coloring because it has a very good blood supply. So you can see that the fibroid is mostly white. And the reason it's mostly white is because it's mostly scar tissue rather than fibroids. Fibroids aren't a big ball of cells, they're a big ball of scarring that gets in there. And clearly as it scars, it can't do the things that normally would happen, like support an endometrium, support a uh, pregnancy. It, it, it doesn't have the structure for that. So one clear characteristic of uterine fibroids is all of that excess scarring that, that you can see here. Well, years ago, um, I was looking at this and looked at how what does it look like between fibroids and the surrounding normal tissue, which is called myometrium. As you can see here on the upper panel stained in blue on the left, A, you see the fibroid, which is mostly that blue color. That's all this um, dense, what's called extracellular matrix or fibrosis. On the right, you see the myometrium has some blue, but you notice that it's kind of organized in a way to kind of to develop muscle bundles that will allow for efficient uterine contraction. So this is dramatically different. And then when you look at it really closely, and this actually is done in, in a combination with Dr. Phyllis Leppard, who you may have seen one of the earlier episodes here, you can see that the little um, strands shown on the lower left are widely spaced and are relatively disorganized, whereas they're pretty well organized if you look to the lower right in the myometrium. So there's clearly something about this, this area surrounding the cells that is different. There's an there's a excess production of this fibrosis, and it's clearly disorganized. Well, one of the challenges we I had when I first started in this field is that we didn't have much else to work with at that time. We could get surgical specimens and we could stain them for a protein, something like that, but we did had no control either before or after. And it was very difficult to do organized studies at that time. So we spent a good amount of time trying to develop new model systems to better study urine fibroids. And we were able to bring it into the laboratory to create kind of standard tissue culture specimens shown here as two-dimensional culture, and then ultimately create a three-dimensional culture so that the fibroids were growing as a 3D object, or essentially we're growing fibroids in the laboratory. And this opens up a lot of doors to allow us to better understand how fibroids develop. One thing that was very important early on was to make sure that we were growing fibroids and not growing out some other cell line that happened to be there that would grow very fast. So we spent a good amount of time identifying genes and proteins that were unique to fibroids and elevated or decreased in fibroids compared to the same, the, the muscle tissue or that myometrial tissue that surrounded it. And we identified them in tissue and then confirmed that they continued to be disrupted in both two-dimensional and three-dimensional cultures. So these served as a very good model for us to uh, be able to identify uh, characteristics that resulted in fibroid development. Now, one of the things that we started to look at was something called curcumin. And curcumin is kind of an interesting compound. It comes up uh, quite a bit uh, as a potential therapy. Um, one of the great things about curcumin is that it acts in many different ways along many different uh, pathways to control inflammation, control um, uh, uh, cancer growth, those, those sorts of issues. Um, and it has a very high, what's called bio, uh, I'm sorry, very high therapeutic index. Um, and therapy, what that means is that you can eat an awful lot of curcumin or turmeric, um, and you, it doesn't really cause you any problems. There's not a lot of side effects. So wouldn't it be great if we could identify something like this, a, a nutritional supplement, if you will, that can act on uterine fibroids. 
Well, that would be very helpful. One thing we did in our laboratory years ago is that we said, well, can curcumin affect the, the fibrosis associated with uterine fibroids? And shown uh, here on the, on the bottom list is increasing concentrations of curcumin. And on the right, how much of a difference there is. And you see a steady decrease at higher and higher concentrations of curcumin. And what this tells us is that, yes, it could work. This is a possible therapy. But remember, this is in vitro. And one of the challenges you have in vitro is that I can put the compound directly on the cells. But the question is, if I give this to a person or a, a, a laboratory animal, are they able to actually get that curcumin to the animal or get to, to the fibroid itself? And this creates some of the challenges with regard to nutritional supplements. These would be wonderful therapies for primary prevention for that woman who has that uterine fibroid, but has no symptoms. If we could say, here is a medicine that you could take that's just going to keep your fibroid at bay, keep it from not growing for as long as you want to take it. And, you know, if you want to have a baby, then you have a baby. And in fact, you can keep taking this medicine because it doesn't really have an impact on this, on, on this, uh, on your pregnancy. And then you keep going and you, your fibroids never cause you a problem. That would be a wonderful dream. However, when we look at it, and I show a couple of examples here, bioavailability is always a problem. What bioavailability represents is the um, how much of the, of the compound is actually getting into the body when you take it orally. So you, the hand on top is roughly the amount of vitamin E that you would need to, um, uh, to be able to get the effect that we see in, in vitro with vitamin E treatment. And on the lower left, a lower panel, this is roughly the amount of resveratrol that you would have, or the amount of red wine that you would have to drink to get a sufficient amount of resveratrol to have an effect. So this becomes an obvious problem that in the absence of good bioavailability, these therapies aren't terribly helpful. And I apologize for the outside noise. So one thing we did is in order to answer this question, in order to address this, we had to create an animal model system so we could test these various therapies. And I can show you, maybe you can see it here. I'm going to try to circle it with my arrow. We were able to grow our three-dimensional cultures right on underneath the skin. And you can see it here on the right, the three-dimensional culture growing so that we could grow human uterine fibroid, what are called xenografts, or culture transplants into mice. We could grow them in um, mice and allow them to develop. The excellent thing about this is that unlike other model systems, which can only usually grow out to four weeks, ours could grow out to at least 12 weeks and continue to grow. And it allowed us to be able to develop a lot of therapies because we knew that these tumors were in fact growing and therefore we could assess the effect of what happened if we treated it. So before we started these, these studies, the one thing that I thought was very important is that we would put the curcumin in the... Um, chow for the mice because if it was impossible for the mice to eat enough curcumin to get an effect then it really didn't matter if we showed an effect if we injected it and saw an effect but no one was going to do daily injections of curcumin it wouldn't make sense to to eat, to continue evaluating this therapy so the first question was if we put it into the chow will the mice eat it and um will that will it get into the bloodstream and the answer to both of those is yes the mice didn't lose weight. They apparently enjoyed their turmeric um, flavored um, mice chow. And we were able to get very reasonable concentrations of both curcumin and which is CUR and various metabolites of curcumin, CG and CS as identified here. And I, I put the uh, reference down below if you're interested in more of the specifics. Then when we looked at the impact of, of uh, uterine or treatment on fibroids, what you see is the um, L stands for lyomyoma or fibroid, control CON and curcumin CUR, M is myometrium or that normal tissue. And what you see is this center line here is aligned to heap an ion. You see a decrease in tumor volume with treatment with curcumin, but with the normal myometrial cultures, you see no real effect. So what that means is that it is specifically acting on the uterine fibroids so as to um, decrease the fibroid size. That's a very, very encouraging finding because 
this is something that could be taken in the diet and had a direct effect on your fibroids. But then the question is how, what, what's going on? So we started to look at the tissue. Again, this should hopefully look a bit more familiar to you. You see in, in a normal case, this compact extracellular matrix. And the, remember the blue staining I said stains for kind of that, uh, that fibrous material, the, this fibrosis that you'd see. And you'll see in the absence of curcumin, it's kind of, it's dense and it's this dark blue. When we treat with curcumin, the, this blue staining is much lighter. And you also see, part of, also see part of it where it's very loose. And what that suggests is something that's, I think, really critical for the treatment of uterine fibroids. Um, one thing that, it, it, let me give an analogy. If I were to develop a therapy that treated all cancer cells specifically and left every other cell alone, I deserve a Nobel Prize. If I develop a therapy that kills every single fibroid cell and leaves everything else alone, I haven't really helped. Because the problem is all of that scar tissue, all of this scar tissue, it's still there. And I have a, another slide of a fibroid that's 5,000 years old from a burial ground in Switzerland. If you don't do something about that fibrous tissue, it's not going anywhere. Well, if I can convince the cells to start breaking it down into this loose ECM extracellular matrix of fibrosis, and I can get it to break that, that down, then I've really made a big difference. This fibroid is going away. It's not just shrinking, it's in fact being broken down. And that's what this medicine appears to do. Now, one thing that's important is when we're looking at fibroids, especially for patients who are trying to get pregnant, what impact does fibroids have? Well, we believe as a field that fibroids inside the uterus that are in, in the lining are a problem and we'll remove those. We believe that those that are on the outside don't tend to impact pregnancy per se. So unless they're very large or creating uh, a, an obstruction of something like that, we tend to leave them alone. But the fibroids that are inside the wall of the uterus, we really don't know the answer to that. And we, as you can see here, we've done a, a whole bunch of different studies and we still can't answer that question very well because it's, as it turns out, a very hard question to, to answer. But the reason it's important is, what do you do if a woman has a small fibroid in the lining of her uterus and she wants to get pregnant? Well, it's possible that that fibroid can cause a problem. It's possible that it will cause no problem. So do you operate? Do you surgically remove it? Is that what we should be doing? Well, surgery has its own risks, right? Looking at this study, it appears if you take all these studies together, there appears to be a negative impact of those fibroids on pregnancy outcome or on miscarriage um, for patients, even if it's not pushing into the endometrial cavity, into the, the womb of the uterus where the baby implants. So what that suggests is we probably should do something about it, but it's really hard to study just these fibroids because again, every single woman who comes in is going to have a different number, a different size, different location of these fibroids. One thing that we were able to do is to look at what happens if we uh, use the same model so that we created, but put it directly into the uterus, put it into that uh, area between the endometrium and the outside. And as you can see here, shown in the yellow circle, we are able to implant that in the uterus. And the other part is that we can use the other horn, this other uh, part here. So this is this is basically a mouse uterus that that is essentially uh, called a two uterine horns. So the human just has these two fused together. A mouse can have both, so they can have multiple pups. Well, one of the issue there issues there is that means that this other horn is unaffected. It's un, I'm I'm not putting the the fibroid cells in that one, but I'm putting the fibroid cells in this one, and that will help us to better understand: Do these specific fibroids create a problem? So we've been able to develop a wide array of model systems to try to answer those questions for the woman who is really trying to understand how best to react when she has small uterine fibroids. This is just an example of what that fibroid then looks like as it grows on that uterine horn. As you can see, this big, big white, you can see a lot of the um, uh, dense tissue in between these little dark spots, which represents the cells compared to the darker purple with the little dots closer together. Those are the mouse cells from that part of the uterus. So we have a whole bunch of questions because we have this model system. Do the fibroids disrupt embryo implantation? Is that how they work? Do they respond in that way? And if they do, 
then it gives you some sense of how we should potentially counsel patients as to whether we should ignore them or treat them. Can we develop a model for heavy menstrual bleeding? Well, we have not yet done that, but that is also part of our intent is to better identify that so we can understand how heavy menstrual bleeding occurs in women, because we don't really know. We know how to treat it to some extent, but we don't really know how it happens. If we better understand how it happens, we may be able to intervene without so many side effects. And then can we expand this model to study early disease uh, therapies, to look at patients who have a little bit of disease versus increasing disease? So the big question is, are we at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning? The data here that I hope you'll agree is promising, is a very encouraging that it can have that effect. It's widely available. You can go onto any search engine and find it, which means that, by the way, I have no financial association with this compound at all, nor could I, because you certainly could just buy it on your own right now. Um, it's pretty inexpensive, and you can also just put it into food directly, and it's very safe for consumption. People can take large single doses. Now, we don't have a lot of information beyond several months with regard to very large doses, but we have we can demonstrate that, generally speaking, this is a safe nutritional additive. But the problem is that we don't really know how this works in humans. I've provided some evidence to suggest that it could work on human disease, but I haven't done it in humans. And that's where it's, it becomes a bit of a challenge. We don't have long-term data on what would happen for that, let's say, 24-year-old with a two-centimeter fibroid. Well, she may choose to continue using curcumin for 30 years, perhaps. Well, we don't have any information to suggest that that's a good idea or safe. So we don't know the answer to that. And this is why we really need to proceed with clinical trials to confirm safety and efficacy. And I've highlighted the fact that because there is no National Institute of Women's Health, there's not a lot of interest in doing that. And I can also tell you that we can't really talk to pharmaceutical companies because why would they sponsor a study when they can't, there's no medication for them to sell. The, there, the medication's already easily accessible through many different sources. So there's not a lot of opportunity to really motivate uh, in uh, large groups to invest in these types of, of uh, studies, but it's a, clearly an important one. It would make a dramatic difference in a wide array of, of people's lives. So we certainly need these novel therapies. We need something to move us away from a surgical intervention to something that is easily managed by a woman at her own pace for her own time in the way that she wants to be managed. This particular compound, in this case, curcumin, has excellent laboratory evidence of such efficacy, and we need those future studies to better determine whether these therapies will work. And if this medication proves to be true, the ability to block that fibroid therapy early would result in the, the elimination of fibroids as being a clinical disease. It could be forestalled to the point where it no longer causes heavy menstrual bleeding, pelvic pain, pelvic pressure, uh, problems with achieving or maintaining pregnancy because you could address them at an early age. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I'm thrilled to answer any questions. Dr. Catherino, thank you so much for that just really insightful um, presentation on your research. It's so good to have you with us today. And uh, I have a lot of questions. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just jump right in. There are so many topics that you touched on that are huge talking points for us uh, in terms of our community and in terms of our outreach and advocacy in terms of legislation. And so I'd like to start at a macro level and then start to get closer to some of the revelations that you presented on curcumin. That's fascinating, if that sounds okay. Absolutely. All right. So you mentioned, uh, I like the way you equated the prevalence of fibroids to hypertension, to asthma. Uh, I think that those uh, ways of kind of looking at the impact of fibroids is critical because just because someone hasn't personally heard of uterine fibroids does not lessen the impact of it. And I find that sometimes in our talking points globally, fibroids are framed as um, 
justifiably the impact on women of African descent. But can you speak to what you've observed in terms of how uterine fibroids have impacted other ethnicities? Sure. In fact, uh, you don't even have to take my word for it. In the figure that I showed with the cumulative incidence, while it is true that women of African descent had an earlier and greater impact, you can see that every other race studied has a similar impact. So this is a, this is a disease of of individuals who have a uterus and are exposed to gonadal hormones. Those are the people that are going to be impacted by uterine fibroids. And this is part of the challenge is that this is a disease that uh, occurs in the reproductive years, has significant uh, symptoms, and ultimately results in um, a, a lot of un unnecessary misery, not just for women of African descent, but for all women. It's important to highlight the fact that women of African descent have a greater prevalence, have a greater likelihood of, of impact. The, those things are true. There is a there is a disparity, but that doesn't mean that it only impacts women of African descent. It really impacts all women. Now, I should caveat this by saying that it's difficult to get these prevalence data uh, sets. It's it's a challenge. There are definitely ethnicities that we really don't have a lot of data on. So it is difficult, and I encourage anybody who is um, going to a, a interesting location, if you have an ultrasound, please start collecting this prevalence data because it is important for us to better understand what about other ethnicities that, that aren't really evaluated, even within the United States. If we could do a better job of defining that, that would be helpful. That being said, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm, perhaps I'm wrong, I can't think of an ethnicity that isn't impacted. I don't know that there is a known ethnicity that is not impacted by uterine fibroids. Thank you so much for clarifying that. That's huge in terms of our advocacy. So uh, I really appreciate that. So I looked at your wonderful graph of the surgical, radiologic, and medical uh, treatments that we know of today. And I thought that not only is it succinct, it just really in one snapshot does a fantastic job of conveying relevant treatment options in a way that's easy to observe, absorb rather, I, I believe. And it's very helpful for the patient who is trying to understand fibroids and understand their options. And I think it, it's also a great um, way of conveying the treatment options in terms of something other clinicians might want to adopt. Uh, was it, do you have any, um, specific aims for how that particular chart might be leveraged? Well, I think there's a couple of important points that, that come off the bat. Certainly, if there was a single therapy that worked for all women with fibroids, there would just be one thing on that chart, right? Or everything else would have disappeared. Um, so it's important to recognize that many people are trying to come up with many mechanisms to treat the many women who are suffering with uterine fibroids. This is, a, this is common. That's why we have so many attempts at, to try to identify a novel therapy. There's clearly a drive to move from surgical to minimally invasive to medical therapies. That's an important drive. And you can see that, that it kind of comes diagonally, I guess, from your, your view that way, um, that, that you see a, a increasing effort more recently to come up with alternative therapies. But certainly surgical intervention has been effective and continues to be effective as one treatment option, but not the only treatment option. And then ultimately, with it also shows that we're having a we get better and better understanding of how uterine fibroids work as we have a better concept, or at least at least from an anatomical to ultimately a functional level. So originally, simply surgically removing the fibroids, either by removing the entire uterus or removing the fibroids directly was the options that we had available. Then we could move to where we damage surrounding tissue to prevent heavy menstrual bleeding. That would be ablation, obstruct blood vessels. Again, these are simple concepts to understand how to treat uterine fibroids. And then we're starting to get into the nuances of how do the hormones actually stimulate fibroid growth and what happens if they're deprived of these hormones. And that's 
kind of the era that we're in now, and hopefully we're going to be able to continue to move and develop even more novel therapies that don't have associated side effects that allow us to provide treatment early in a woman's reproductive lifespan so that one, she doesn't suffer on a regular basis, and two, her reproductive options and her life options are opened up and she's not put in a position where she has to make personal choices as to how she wants her life to go that she wouldn't otherwise have chosen but for those fibroids. Those are very important points as well. I, I really appreciated your comment on moving away from surgery, the, the concept of moving away from surgery, and also you stating that the uterus is not treated with respect because it absolutely is not. And the stigmas that we constantly combat societally really reflect the lack of respect for the uterus and the gift that the uterus is to our society and to all of our lives. Um, I'm really fascinated with that concept of moving away from surgery. One, because I know that our community would love that. You know, when you look at the global searches on uterine fibroids, the top question is, one of the top questions is always, how can I avoid surgery? So when we're looking at, at these therapies, it's really important to really understand how precious the uterus is to the patient, and hopefully uh, it will become to society at large. I, I really wonder how, if you have any thoughts on how we can continue to convey that message across the clinical community so that they in turn hopefully can reassure the patient community that that is a focal point or do you think it's too premature for that well no i i think it's i think you're exactly right we need to call it out that that you know we could say rationally people could live with one lung so who's going to sign up to remove a lung nobody mm -hmm. we could live with one kidney who's going to sign up to have our kidney removed nobody we could live without a big chunk of our skin. Anybody want to do skin grafts? And no, nope, nobody's going to sign up for this. So in every other area, the concept of surgical intervention is, is very way down on the list. Most people would not consider it as an option. Now, one, again, modern medical miracle, the concept of a cesarean section allowed us to start operating on the uterus and getting a sense that we could operate and leave the uterus in place in effective delivery. And so we've gotten good at being comfortable operating on the uterus in a scenario where the uterus was in fact functionally normal. Now we're talking about, well, now that we can do that, you know, it, it makes it less of a jump to say, is it really necessary to maintain that uterus? And that's a very different question than it is okay to remove the uterus. Um, you know, we can come up with lots of scenarios where it makes complete sense to remove the uterus, where there's a cancer involved, where there's heavy bleeding that cannot be controlled in surgical emergencies that makes complete sense. However, we've kind of gone down that slippery slope of saying, well, if it's if the uterus is inconvenient, then that's a time to, you know, remove the remove the uterus. Well, you know, I might have a little back pain sometimes. My back is inconvenient. It's not an option I don't consider of, well, maybe I should have my spine removed because, you know, then I won't have to worry about that anymore. I'll have many other problems, but I won't have that problem. So this, we've, we've essentially created this false sense that this is going to solve problems without creating other problems. And again, there are times when it's going to solve more problems than it creates. But if we can come up with other therapies that can provide even greater benefit at less cost to the patient, then that's exactly what we should be doing. And we haven't ended the story of uterine fibroids by saying she can simply have a hysterectomy. That's that is a uh, that's not not sufficient. It wouldn't be sufficient for anyone to consider that with any other tissue or any other organ. It's simply not sufficient for uterine fibroids as well. Uh, that's huge. And I couldn't agree more because you're essentially throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think that, you know, as you stated, there are circumstances 
um, under which a hysterectomy makes sense because it's more advantageous for that patient to have the hysterectomy than to not have it. But there are many other considerations that should take place prior to jumping to hysterectomy. So again, I appreciate that overview, which is so thorough and so important to convey to our community and, and clinicians as well. Um, clinicians are um, are an important part of our community. How vital it is to really have that conversation comprehensively. So thank you for that. Yeah. I am super intrigued about growing fibroids in the lab. And I'm curious, how long has it taken to accomplish that? It's, um it's it's a it's taken several decades of work and certainly it's a project that has involved many many people um i've just been fortunate to be part of this great experiment that we've been doing and l- i don't recall let me just go through this again way back in the day we had nothing like when we started in the early 2000s if you wanted to study uterine fibroids you had two choices really you had either to go into the operating room obtain some tissue, but at that point you had no control of why the woman was there, what was going on at the time, what she had eaten or been exposed to, who she was. You had no no control over that. And then you would just do what you could in the laboratory and then you'd go back and have a totally different patient. So it was very difficult to get consistent information. We had that, or we had situations where we had models and a model is better than no model but the models that we had really weren't replicating human disease. They were an entirely different disease process. So this created some of the challenges of how do we study uterine fibroids? And this led to the first question of, I can grow cells out. You can take a bit of tissue, put it in a plate, the cells will grow out. But the problem is the cells that are most likely to grow out are fibroblasts. They grow really fast and really well. And if you don't do something about that, all you're going to do is have a bunch of cells that don't really define what fibroids are. They're just human fibroblasts. So we had to identify what was a what molecular changes occur in fibroids so that we could then confirm that our cell lines were in fact fibroid and myometrium. So that took a while, as you can imagine. And this is early and you know, we were just getting microarray online. So we didn't have a lot of those options to really best define this. It was really just brute force. Um, then developing the 3D model was, again, the brainchild of, of Dr. Malik. It was a very important step because we recognized that most of the fiber is all that fibrosis tissue. And to be able to develop that three-dimensional model completely changed the way in which we both approach fibroids and the way in which we work with them, because then you can just grow the fibroid, allow it to grow in a three-dimensional space And you can evaluate the impact that various therapies or exposures are having on that. So that's really made a huge difference in our ability to understand fibroids as they grow because we can watch them in the laboratory. But the one limitation we had there is we want to treat patients and we want to know what happens when patients are exposed to certain things. We want to know if these tumors can stimulate their own blood supply because anybody who's been in the operating room with fibroids sees all of these unusual blood vessels that tend to surround fibroids. We know that fibroids are somehow supporting that blood supply, but we don't really understand why. And we've done a few studies to try to answer it, but we're still trying to tease that out. Well, we can see that in a a, a mouse model. We can see those blood vessels. So again, if we can understand how fibroids do it and we can stop that, we can stop the fibroids from growing to a size where it matters. If we just have very, very small fibroids, they're not going to have that much of an impact. And if we can intervene early, we can make an enormous difference. So the model systems really mattered for us to be able to answer questions that are more and more patient relevant. And it it does, it takes time, it takes a lot of effort, but it's been a joy to be able to be part of this process, to be able to answer some of these questions. And again, it's not just me. Dr. Lepper is a great leader in this. Dr. Seeger is a fantastic leader in this. Dr. Alhendi, Dr. Marsh, there's many, many, many people. I don't. I, I fear saying names because I will leave people out who are tremendous leaders and my mentors along the way as well. So it's been an honor to be even part of the community. Wow, that's a beautiful sentiment. And I completely understand uh, that as well. And I was about to 
say that I appreciate those decades of dedication um, for all parties involved in that research because it really is a game changer. And the blood vessels that you describe that are in and around the fibroid that, <clears throat> excuse me, that we don't completely understand all of the dynamics there yet are one of the things that really make the uterine fibroid challenge and experience agonizing for the patient because those blood vessels just pulsate. And it's it's a, a, a feeling that's so hard to describe. And then you compound that with it occurs for possibly one to two days as it did with me every single month for decades. And it is a, just a horrible feeling to have to exist in society and go about your day-to-day -day activities and be in that type of pain. So I really am looking forward to the expansion of, of that work and, and, and the Fibroid Foundation um, supporting, you know, you and team with, with furthering the examination of, of those types of impacts um, on the women that have uterine fibroids. Um, I think that's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Thank you for your support. Of course. Uh, so your 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 picture with the what was it five bottles of wine had I giggled when I saw that. Uh, it was pretty funny, and it and your mention of vitamin E reminded me of something. And 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 viewers, please don't be shy. Ask questions. I am monitoring the chat. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully, um, you know, letting your voices be heard today. I think it's so important for us to interface with our amazing presenters by sharing what's uh, immediately on your minds. I see one question that came in right now, Dr. Catherino. Any data, um, even anecdotal, of decreased fibroid preve prevalence and pregnancy risks in populations with high curcumin dietary consumption? That's a great question. There, we do not have that data. And it would be a, a fascinating to be able to go to areas where there is high curcumin intake and simply evaluate the prevalence, not just of fibroids, but of large fibroids. Um, this isn't a complicated study. There's lots of people who are exposed to very high levels of curcumin on a regular basis. We simply don't have anybody who has gone out there and done these studies. And I, I would, I welcome those studies. I welcome the studies in every area. If we identified a group of people who were, you know, had very, very low prevalence, that would be important to better understand what environmental factors could be involved. Um, it's just hard to get this data. It requires a dedicated group of not just clinicians, but patients to, to come in and recognize that this is an important health issue. And undergo these ultrasounds. So I'm not blaming anybody. I just hope to continue to encourage people to go out there and collect that information. I would love to be able to see that information. Now, it's certainly possible that if you have intermittent curcumin exposure, it may be insufficient. And for people who take curcumin on a regular basis, they might have a better effect. So it would be important still, I believe, to do some sort of clinical trial to better understand what consistent exposure to curcumin can do in the setting of the presence of uterine fibroids. Um, that simply going through, and my hope someday is that should all of this be true, um, that it would be a nutritional supplement that we would simply add, be able to provide to, to women who are identified as having uterine fibroids, but are not yet symptomatic. So I certainly hope that day comes, but I think we really need to objectively and um, systematically study how curcumin impacts fibroids. Um, and I like the idea, as you pointed out, of real world evidence to actually be able to understand what's happening out there to see if we can better understand and provide information for those who are naturally taking or naturally exposed to high levels of curcumin. And your response highlights another need, which is more research funding, because mm -hmm. for a health concern that impacts 26 million U.S. women, and we have no idea how many millions more around the world, the funding stream for research has been a pittance relative to the community impacted. And so as Dr. Catherino just referenced, there are so many other studies that we would like to uh, pursue that there's just currently not the bandwidth. And so 
we at the Fiberb Foundation dedicate for or advocate for dedicated funding streams annually to address uterine fibroids. We really desperately need that. So thank you again. So my last question is, uh, oh, okay. We have a question from uh, online. I'll go with that one, Dr. Okay. Katarina. Can you discuss the downsides of surgical fibroid intervention on fertility? Is scar tissue a risk I should be considering? Um, so complicated question. The answer is it in comparison to keeping the fibroids in place. So then it becomes an important individual question between you and your doctor. If the plan is to have children in the future and there are fibroids that are impacting the endometrial cavity, meaning they're inside, potentially causing heavy bleeding, there's at least some data to support removing those. And it doesn't result in, it's usually done um, through the cervix and doesn't usually result in scar tissue, although it can, and it's important to follow up and make sure there's no uh, adhesions or scars within the uterus. For those that are within the wall of the uterus, it's a bigger surgery requiring either a laparoscopic, robotic, or even an open where you have a larger incision and then these fibroids are removed. The scarring within the uterus is not typically as much of an issue as the scarring around the uterus to surrounding tissues. And that can create, uh, in the same way that a cesarean section can typically result in uh, scarring that can occur to surrounding tissues that can create its own set of problems. So it's not that this surgery is without problems. However, if the fibroids are causing significant pain, heavy bleeding, um, other issues, then there may be a, the benefit of surgical removal may exist. And so that's why it's important to talk about all the options, including surgery. It's an option. But in the end, is the value of the surgery uh, greater than the risks or complications of the surgery? And that's a, a, on an individual level. It's hard to come up with a general statement as to whether it is consistently or is not consistently. And I'd like to highlight um, another statement that you made that's so critical when you were discussing um, in vitro application of some of the treatment modalities that you're researching. Because you mentioned vitamin E, and I couldn't agree more because oftentimes online, there are um, recommendations from non-physicians to apply various oils to the abdomen. And when I was desperate for treatment, I tried that and it was disastrous. Like it took so long for the oil, I won't say which one, to parse through my abdomen. I was hemorrhaging for hours and hours and hours and there was nothing I could do about it once that once my body had absorbed that oil. And mm -hmm. I, your point about making sure that the application is direct to the or isolated to the actual area of, or fibroid or area of concern is super critical for those in the community whom I understand are suffering, are trying to find treatment options, may not be able to afford a surgical intervention or may not have a provider near them to provide a surgical intervention. Please be very careful about applying uh, oils to your abdomen and other uh, treatment options that you read about online. Everything needs to be incredibly well vetted to ensure that you're healthy and safe. So thank you for that, Dr. Katharina. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure to speak with you as always. We just really uh, value you uh, as a member of our medical advisory board and you always bring such fantastic contributions to this space. And uh, I have just so appreciated your presentation today. And thank you again for spending this time with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Every four women in the U.S. will develop uterine fibroids by the time they're 50. But a recent study showed some troubling trends when it comes to how doctors are treating the problem. Local 10 medical specialist Christy Kruger is in the newsroom and has details in our health cast. Well, here's the question. Are too many women getting hysterectomy? Reaching out to our U.S. senators. You know, this again, I think, is low-hanging fruit in terms of an ask for their support.
And I think that we can't be shy in expressing to our leadership in the United States House of Representatives what an imperative this is for us. And so where uh, we can get uh, women across this nation mobilized and emphatic about them sponsoring this legislation, mm -hmm. that's the momentum we need to get it signed into law. We're trying to destigmatize conversations about fibroids. Talk to your friends, talk to your coworkers, your family about fibroids. Issue that impacts 26 million women a year in America, but rarely talked about. We're talking about uterine fibroids. In the worst cases, treatment includes hysterectomies. ABC 10's Van 2 tells us how the condition impacts women of color at higher rates, and how doctors are fighting for more minimally invasive procedures to treat What them. we would like to work on is uh, targeting more uh, anti-progestin pathways and develop drugs that do not have such uh, bad side effects. Uh, but randomized clinical trials have been done for heart disease and for cancer and for all kinds of therapies and they're just now being applied for uterine fibroids. Yes. So the national audience needs to know that there are so many options for their fibroids. So there are medications that shrink fibroids. There are procedures that you can do to shrink your fibroids. I'm excited to share an interview I taped with Dr. Serdar Bulun, a researcher at Northwestern University. Dr. Bulun has managed a significant number of fibroid studies and is incredibly passionate about uncovering the causes of fibroids and endometriosis. In this interview, Dr. Bulun will share his research results on how phthalates or plastics affect fibroids. After the interview, Dr. Bulun will join me for a live question and answer segment. Dr. Bulun, thank you so much for spending time with us today. I was really looking forward to speaking with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So you studied uterine fibroids for quite some time. I remember when I met you well over a decade ago. And I'm curious, what led you to focus on uterine fibroid and endometriosis research so intently? When I was a medical student, I was really interested in this uh, hormone, estrogen. Um, estrogen biology fascinated me. Mm. And this led me to the question, uh, what kind of tissues estrogen works on? both uh, normal and uh, pathological. And endometriosis and fibroids were the um, most important uh, problems or public health issues mm -hmm. uh, in our country that are affected by estrogen. That kind of what got me into the field. That is fascinating to me because I'm just learning how pivotal estrogen is on the body as a whole. Um, so that's, that's, I'm very curious about that. So from your studies over the years, what has surprised you the most? Um, I was uh, shocked as to how many myths existed regarding both diseases. I'll give you some examples. Please. For example, um, a lot of uh, physicians or scientists will start by saying that endometriosis is an enigmatic disease. It's not. Actually, it's fairly well understood compared to rheumatoid arthritis or some of the other inflammatory diseases. It happens because of retrograde or backward Mm -hmm. travel of blood mm -hmm. and uh, massive material and the inner lining of the uterus which is called endometrial fragments into the lower abdomen and in 10% of women these uh, tissues are uh, abnormal enough to implant there and survive there and cause inflammation. It's as simple as this. Uh, but th there is so much uh, misinformation out there mm -hmm. that uh, people cannot see this directly. Mm -hmm. 
in case of fibroids, it's the same story. When I first started, I realized that a lot of scientists and clinicians did not see fibroids as real tumors. Uh, whenever I started to uh, give one of these presentations or lectures, somebody mm -hmm. would raise their hand and say, well, I mean, this is not a real tumor. It's all about like how fibrosis or scar tissue is formed. Mm -hmm. And my response would be always like, there has to be some cells to lay down the scar tissue. Mm -hmm. Until the year 2011, actually fibroids were never taken as serious tumors. Wow. Until this Finnish group cloned the uh, MED12 mutations, mm. okay. which uh, accounted for 70% uh, of all fibroids. Uh, this was not the case. And I'm, I'm glad that now uh, there is more um, clear thinking about this and they are seen as uh, serious tumors. They behave as tumors. They have mutations mm -hmm. like tumors. They uh, respond to hormones as tumors. And we both know that they can grow as big as a uh, soccer ball okay. and cause a lot of problems. So these misconceptions mm -hmm. and misinformations mm -hmm. have always surprised me. That's really fascinating and I'm glad that you are sharing that with us um, because I've never heard endometriosis described that directly and I wasn't aware that 2011 was such a pivotal year in fibroid research. Um, and I, I know that that clarity that you provided is going to help a lot of people um, when they see this video. I wonder, since you mentioned MED-12, would you um, explain to our audience what the MED-12 um, gene is? MED-12 is a very interesting gene. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about like uh, 25,000 genes in our entire DNA, wow. in our genome and the DNA is the same sequence in every cell that we have. Mm -hmm. MET12 is one of these 25,000 uh, genes and it encodes a protein. Both the gene and the size of the protein are humongous compared to other genes in our body. Mm -hmm. The product of this gene, the protein, uh, serves a very important function in the DNA. Basically what it does is it helps DNA to fold in a certain way so that other genes would encode messenger RNAs wow. and proteins uh, in a proper fashion so that these cells would uh, act normally. Mm. So the mutation occurs only in one of the chromosomes. As you know, we all have like two chromosomes, uh, two pairs of chromosomes of each in uh, all of our cells. The mutation happens only in one chromosome, but it's not corrected by the other normal okay. allele. And this leads to a uh, chaos as to how genes are um, expressed and respond to progesterone. In fact, that's what we discovered in my lab. The changes in MET12 gene and the mutation leads to a chaotic production of proteins that lead to a uh, tumor environment. That is so interesting because I'm thinking back over my own medical history and I'm going back about 20 years now where I was prescribed progesterone on more than one occasion and it caused heavy menstrual bleeding. And when I spoke with the clinician, they told me that it would help with the fibroids, but it did the exact opposite. 
So what you just described with Med 12 is just clarifies for me what I was experiencing as a patient but didn't understand the science behind it. So thank you for sharing that um, with us. And I'm sure that many of our listeners have not heard of Med 12, which is some very important research to, know, to be aware of. Um, so I'm so thrilled to speak with you about your recent study on phthalates. Um, and your phthalate research is groundbreaking, the findings. What are phthalates? and how are we impacted by them? Phthalates are environmental pollutants and they are not considered as serious as some of the other pollutants uh, such as for example dioxin mm -hmm. or BPA um, and uh, this is not because they may not be as dangerous, but we do not understand them well. Therefore, many governments across the world have not banned talates through mm -hmm. legislation, which is another interesting mm -hmm. subject. Uh, we were interested in talates because we heard that if a woman has a higher uh, concentration of phthalates in her urine, mm -hmm. she would be at increased risk for ha having a fibroid. We were really interested in this. Yeah. <coughs> right around that time, we discovered that this MET12 mutation affects uh, the tumor cells, the fibroid tumor cells, in such a way that the tumors start producing a internal hormone named kynurinin. Wow. Uh, because of a inappropriate activation of an enzyme. And kynurinin goes and binds to a uh, receptor called AHR. Okay. And once kynurinin activates AHR, mm -hmm. all sorts of bad things happen in these tumors. The mm -hmm. tumors grow faster, they survive longer, they don't respond to treatments. And a very smart uh, fellow mm -hmm. uh, who studied here and went back to his uh, home country, Japan now, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Izuka uh, suggested that we should look at phthalates and see whether phthalates stimulate this mechanism of mm -hmm. kynurinin production and HR activation. What he found was, uh, in fact, phthalates did increase the kynurinin formation and therefore uh, they activated uh, AHR indirectly and caused uh, increased uh, tumor survival and resistance to drugs. Which is interesting is uh, AHR mm -hmm. was originally cloned, uh, first isolated and then cloned in the 80s and 90s as the receptor for dioxin. And dioxin was the compound that mm -hmm. was uh, responsible for uh, the bad effects of uh, Agent Orange wow. that was used in Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, as exfoliants. After the Vietnam War, it was found out that the populations, especially female populations, who were exposed mm -hmm. to dioxin mm -hmm had all sorts of uh, reproductive abnormalities, including uterine abnormalities, fibroids, um, pregnancy losses, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you could make the mm -hmm. connection, almost like you could see Thales as a milder mm -hmm. uh, inducers of AHR, which is the common pathway for also dioxin. That is absolutely fascinating. 
and you're giving us a history lesson as well. One of the key words that you used that really um, stuck out for me was resistance because I think about how fibroids behave in the body and how frustrating it is as a patient to undergo a major surgery and, and have fibroids return. For me, fibroids returned in under pr probably between nine to 12 months. Each time I had a major surgery, they were back and I was again experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding. And I think about the resistance that um, the fibroids seem to display in the body. They continue to grow um, despite the surgical interventions and any, you know, for, my, for me, dietary changes that I would make um, could only provide an incremental um, benefit to me personally. And so what you just described is just really groundbreaking. And I think, you know, we haven't traditionally talked about the environmental impacts of uh, or how fibroids are, are um, activated by our environment per se. And we haven't been able to specify a particular catalyst. So I'm really very, very grateful for your research um, because it, it really, you know, you feel like you're fighting against something that's unknown and this helps us to really focus on some potential um, concrete um, influencers of what we're dealing with physically. So um, it, it just, I think this is really resonating with a lot of, of women with fibroids and um, I'm just really excited to, to learn about this, so thank you. So you mentioned AHR, which is one of my later questions, but since you um, did uh, mention AHR, uh, I had a note on an AHR for our audience is aryl hydrocarbon receptors. Um, how does AHR, uh, what is the relationship between AHR and DEHP? Right, so um, we mentioned the uh, internally made hormone kynurenine, which activates AHR. So kynurenine is made of an amino acid mm. with which most of us are fairly familiar, especially during Thanksgiving. It's tryptophan. Oh, okay. So uh, tryptophan is taken up, it's an amino acid. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very rich in Turkey, right? So, uh, and just like any other amino acids, uh, tryptophan uh, is taken up by different cells in the body uh, from outside into the cytoplasm of the cell and then is um, metabolized there further. So the, one of the enzymes that metabolizes tryptophan is called TDO2, uh, tryptophan deoxygenase 2. And this enzyme's product is kynurenin. And kynurenin, again, uh, if it's produced in very high levels, it does bad things mm -hmm. like um, increasing the half-life of a tumor helping with the survival of a tumor wow. and things like that. So what um, phthalates do is, A, they increase the uptake of tryptophan by the fibroid cells. B, they increase the production of kynurenine. Okay. So therefore, uh, they do help for tumor cells to survive longer and again, be more resistant resistant to the natural um, uh, defenses of the body mm -hmm. or the medications against fibroids. Right. And that helps me to understand how those higher levels would then c cause the growth of fibroids um, in the body. That's really interesting. So do we know how long phthalates stay in the body? I know you said that they can be detected in urine samples. I think they could be staying long, but I'm not going to get into okay. areas in which 
I'm not an expert. Okay, I in, appreciate and that. And I do not know exactly how long they stay, but long enough to cause problems. Okay, all right. Um, how soon could we potentially see uh, more AHR research? Um, soon. Okay. We are uh, working on it actively. I suspect there may be more laboratories, mm -hmm. both in the U.S. and other parts of the world, who might be acting, uh, who might be working mm -hmm. on AHR. I think it's a very important target. Me too. For yeah. fibroids. I do too. Um, so, are there any other key? Um, findings on your phthalate research that you'd like to share with our audience? I just want to make sure that we cover the major topics. Um, yes. So phthalates, as you know, is a general name for a large number of compounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are certain compounds in these phthalates uh, uh, that could be more dangerous than others. In general, phthalates have like multiple uh, phenol rings, just like many other environmental pollutants, mm -hmm. or sometimes uh, medications that we take. And they live for long times in any environment. In the body, once uh, a certain phthalate is ingested, it is metabolized to different products. In fact, the one phthalate, environmental phthalate, is called DEHP, mm -hmm. and the body, human body, metabolizes it in different tissues, such as the liver, wow. to MEHHP. And we think that this MEHHP is the most dangerous phthalate mm. uh, that would prolong uh, the survival of uh, fibroid. fibroid tumors. Wow. Okay, you're giving us a lot of information to consider here today. Well, Dr. Bulun, I'm excited to share with our audience that you'll be speaking at our Fibroid Summit in September, our third annual Fibroid Summit, and <coughs> we're really looking forward to um, continuing this conversation on your research, the phthalate research, and the other just really impressive body of, of work that you have contributed to women's health over the years. So I'm deeply grateful for all that you do and um, last question, how can our community members follow your research? Um, good question. I'm usually most scientists uh, or some scientists mm -hmm. do not represent their research on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I still think the best uh, uh, platform would be PubMed, okay. um, as you know, PubMed uh, indexes all the scientific papers mm -hmm. that are published. And most of these papers are peer reviewed so that there is uh, less risk mm -hmm. for misinformation or embellished information. I would still uh, encourage everybody to go to PubMed, support PubMed. Okay. In fact, uh, it is supported by the U.S. government. It's okay. one of the, you know, major mm -hmm. um, uh, services mm -hmm. of the government, mm -hmm. and um, probably that would be the best source okay. of information. If you would just go there and write my last name Bulun and put my initial S, okay. you will see all my papers. That's and fantastic. I invite everybody to take a look. Okay, well we will do exactly that and we will provide a link when we post this. And again, I just want to thank you, Dr. Bulun, for your time today. It has been absolutely fascinating to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Bulun, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for being here today. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course, your research is so fascinating. Can you share with our audience what led you to focus on phthalates? 
Yes, uh, it was a little bit serendipitous. Uh, one scientist in my um, team uh, uh, read about uh, phthalates and saw that uh, uh, phthalates are uh, more concentrated in the urines of uh, patients, of women, who happens to have a symptomatic uterine fibroid. Uh, separately, we also uh, were uh, working on this uh, cell signaling pathway, which makes salates grow. And there is a nuclear receptor called AHR. Uh, this nuclear receptor, for example, responds to environmental uh, pollutants such as dioxin, the active agent, for example, in the in Agent Orange that was used in Vietnam in the past. And some of you may know that uh, there have been a lot of reproductive abnormalities uh, in women uh, in Vietnam after the war. So uh, they were attributed to this like uh, nuclear receptor AHR. So we had the hypothesis that could phthalates, another environmental pollutant, activate AHR and therefore cause uterine fibroid growth. We don't think that phthalates uh, cause formation of a new fi a fibroid tumor, but we are, we are thinking that it may like uh, make small tumors grow and become symptomatic. So uh, that's where we came from. And that's, that's what started our research. Thank you for sharing that. So Dr. Phyllis Leppard has a question for you. And I'd like to also um, compliment Dr. Leppard. She's been a wonderful partner to the Fibroid Foundation. And she's an amazing researcher and gynecologist. Uh, she asked if you could let us know where phthalates can be found in the environment. Uh, first, hi, Dr. Leopard. Dr. Leopard and I, we are old friends. And to, uh, uh, to rephrase her question, Dr. Leopard asked, uh, where could phthalates be found in the environment? So phthalates are plasticizers and they are uh, really used uh, uh, a lot uh, in uh, many products that we use. Some of these products could be as simple as like window, uh, windows and, you know, some parts of the windows, some like um, um, some material used in architecture. But uh, the worried part is like a lot of pallets are, uh, pallets are used in plastic in plastic bottles in in cosmetic products for example uh, 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 for example in nail products in hair products uh, so uh, in in like uh, uh, food storage um, industry so they are, we think that they are like, uh, you know, um, they are in our system and they get into our system, into our bodies through various ways. And one way of like measuring them is to, you know, the gold standard has been to measure the phthalate levels in the urines of women. And, um, and, and as I uh, indicated earlier, uh, if phthalate levels are high, there's a higher uh, risk for a woman to have a uh, symptomatic fibroid. Dr. Bulun, I'd love to, as a follow-up after today, um, be able to share with our community some ways to minimize phthalate exposure in their environment if 
you are aware of anyone who can speak to that or any person on your team, because that's a question that we get frequently, because of course, once we know that the impact of the phthalates on our bodies, it's um, very intriguing for us to want to know how to manage that process. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to add about that right now, about just uh, minimizing the exposure? Sure. I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm a, um, I'm, I'm not an environmental scientist by training, so I'm not going to pretend what I'm not. But I think, uh, I think we could like uh, do simple things. For example, I, I drink uh, water, but I drink it out of a glass. Um, uh, so uh, you know, decreasing you know, plastic materials in the foods that we consume might be a good first start. Okay. And, and if you are like buying fast food, right, you don't know how it was uh, prepared. The, that, that's important, right? Um, so I would encourage everybody uh, to make sure that what you eat is uh, first see what you eat. I mean, prepare your own food, like buy your own food, prepare it, stay, stay more aware, uh, away from like, you know, how, how they say, how they joke about that's how sausage is made. We don't know how sausage is made, although it may taste good, but don't eat things that you don't know how, how they were made. Uh, prepare your own food. I mean, take things in your own hands first. When you are using a product, uh, for example, if you, uh, let's, let's talk about cosmetics, right? I mean, if you're looking at cosmetic products, uh, Google your products. Uh, I mean, the, if you look at the packaging of the product, I don't think they will tell you how much phthalate is in that product because phthalates are not uniformly regulated in every country, including the United States. And I don't know the exact details of that. And I never may know this, but I think we can do a lot of things to control uh, what we expose our bodies to by taking personal responsibility. I mean, that's the first thing I would recommend to everybody. That's what I do. Yeah, that's what I've done thus far too. And I appreciate that feedback and will continue to definitely um, uh, access an environmentalist to help complement your research. And you mentioned that you published a new paper. Um, would you share with us what that new paper on phthalates covers? Absolutely. So uh, I mentioned that phthalates uh, target this receptor called AHR, right? Uh, it's called aryl hydrocarbon receptor. The first time this receptor was discovered, everybody thought that, you know, it uh, responds to dioxin in the environment only, and then the dioxin does all these nasty things on our bodies. But later on, scientists found that the body also makes a substance called kynurenin, which is like made from an amino acid uh, so kynurenin uh, uh, is made from tryptophan in the body. And then if it's made, then kynurenin binds to AHR and it, this uh, hormonal pathway also makes fibroids grow. So this phthalate research uh, kind of led us uh, to this, uh, to looking more seriously at this pathway. And separately, we found that uh, a uh, very common mutation that gives rise to 70% of all the fibroids, fibroid tumors in all women, a metal mutation, further stimulates this pathway. So like if a, a so then we started developing medications to target this pathway to stop fibroid growth. 
And the good news is uh, because 70% of all fibroids uh, originate from this mutation, there's a very high likelihood that 70% of fibroids or 70% of women with fibroids will respond to this treatment. Although it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex than that, sometimes in the same woman, we find two fibroids, one of them originates from a MET12 mutation, the other one originates from a different mutation. So it's a little bit more complex than that. But I mean, if we treat all women, we estimate that at least 70% of them will respond to this treatment, which I'll take, which is good. Yeah. That's that's huge. And I, I hope that it does um, impact the fiber growth in, in that many women. And uh, we've talked a lot today already about um, non-invasive treatments. And so this sounds like it definitely would be one which probably would be preferred in our community. Um, what do you think it will require in terms of a next logical step to examine the, the these pathways and a next step toward trying to develop such a treatment and how can our community um, support you and in, in your team in terms of requesting that the medical community look at this more closely or allow you to expand your research options? How can patients help? I guess that's my question. Thank you for asking this. I, I think, uh, you know, this, uh, the answer to this question itself is the, probably the most challenging uh, problem that we have in fibroid research, right? I mean, until now, by uh, both by medical community, by gynecologists, by the, by the public, by everybody else, we were all conditioned that the only uh, way to address fibroids is either you take them out uh, surgically, uh, either one by one, or take out the entire uterus, which is hysterectomy, or uh, you have to like somehow destroy them with these like less invasive methods, like uh, denying blood supply to fibroids, for example, is one, um, or uh, targeting them with uh, ultrasound waves is another one. But like the uh, the studies that uh, concentrates on like medical treatments really lag behind. Partly because like probably people did not believe that they would work to start with, uh, and partly because we did not know about fibroids. I mean, like the game changer in the entire fibroid field, in my opinion, was uh, this uh, science publication by uh, Dr. Altonen uh, from Finland in 2011. I mean, they demonstrated that each fibroid uh, originates from a uh, somatic mutation uh, that happened in uh, myometrial uh, smooth muscle cells. I mean, that was a game changer. Unless you understand something, you cannot treat it or you cannot target it. So. I think uh, what we can do is we can uh, re-educate ourselves and uh, and our patient population and the clinical community, the medical community. That no, we can We don't have to like uh, resort to hysterectomies and myomectomies and other physical means, but we can also um, there is a possibility at least to control the growth of the fibroids. So that yes, a woman may have like a few fibroids, but they may not grow any further to cause uh, like significant symptoms. Mm -hmm. And a woman can uh, live with the fibroids because as you know, probably sometimes it's, if you uh, perform an ultrasound study on all women, you know, in a community, uh, it's hard to find a woman without fibroid. Uh, so it's like uh, most women might have a small fibroid, but it may not get symptomatic. I think it's really 
interesting, it would be important to understand why some of them grow and why some of them don't grow. The ones who are growing and causing these symptoms, I believe that we can develop like uh, medications with minimal side effects, acceptable side effects to keep them from causing symptoms. Um, that's where we are coming from and that's what we've been working on. But for this, we need more basic research. Unless we understand fibroids, we're not going to be able to deal with it. <clears throat> I, I agree, Dr. Buller. And um, just a follow-up question for clarification for patients. I think sometimes when we talk about uh, medical studies, it can be a little overwhelming or scary sometimes for patients. And when you reference the uh, urine collection and the measuring the phthalate amount in urine, that's a very seemingly non-invasive way of having um, patients participate in a study. And it's really our goal at the Fibroid Foundation to vet medical study with studies rather with very caring researchers like yourself who are going to care for the patients who are involved in the studies. Would you expand um, a little more on what your ask was of the patients who participated in the study for uh, of phthalates just for clarification? Um, our ask was for these patients to you know, donate their tissues and also allow us to collect, uh, give us a urine sample so that we can measure tallies and that was it. And uh, and I understand that, you know, collecting urine is um, kind of like a tedious sometimes process. And, uh, and it can also like, uh, for example, the, let's say my hand is the, you know, um, uterus and there's a fibroid here right and uh, and the bladder is like far from the fibroid right i mean the probably when we measure thalates in the urine what we are measuring is uh like the patient's level of exposure to the thalates but it's like really removed from the process of like thalate exposure of the fibroids right now which was, this was not done before. We are trying to measure thalates directly in the fibroid tissue, directly in, in uterus, the, the uh, target organ of thalates. And I think uh, we believe that that's going to increase the accuracy, but we are not asking for patients to do anything extra. What we are asking is like, if a patient goes through uh, surgery for fibroids, we are uh, what we are saying to the patients is look you know um uh you know the pathologist would look at your fibroid if it's not like malignant and like 99.9 percent .9 of the time they are not, not malignant they are going to discard your tissue uh would you allow us uh to that tissue to be discarded to come to our lab so that we can work on it so um, it doesn't cost the patient any money. It doesn't um, affect the treatment of the patient. It doesn't directly help that patient either, but uh, it helps the community of women uh, who have fibroids and in the future, this may lead to treatment. Thank you for explaining that. We have a question from our community online. Can you please explain why you believe that phthalates won't initiate fibroid formation, but will increase size of existing ones? That's an excellent question. I mean, uh, I cannot, of course, say that with certainty that phthalates do not initiate fibroids. Yes, I mean, it's possible that phthalates can also uh, cause mutations. Uh, increase the risk of mutations. But so far, I haven't seen any publications in which studies would uh, cause mutagenesis. We think that uh, the mutations are caused in, uh, in uterine cells, uh, interestingly, by estrogen, by estrogen exposure, because like uterus is exposed to so much estrogen that's like flowing from the ovaries all the time. 
and estrogen could be like uh, some products of estrogen could be genotoxic and i believe i mean this is just this is like a total speculation we haven't demonstrated this but i think that there's like so much estrogen concentrated in uterine tissues that like eventually they uh, they may like it may affect the hot spots or uh, mutations and that's probably how these mutations start but i have no evidence one way or the other whether and i i think the tallies kind of like uh, uh make these like mutated cells grow further but you know this could be a wrong usually this is what we do as scientists we kind of like put out a hypothesis and either prove it or refuse it well i'm encouraged by the hypothesis that you've developed thus far and our community has been incredibly responsive, which is exactly why we wanted to include your phthalate research in Summit as well as earlier this year, because our community was so incredibly intrigued uh, with this notion. Uh, and we look forward to learning more. And Dr. Bulun, I can't emphasize en enough how much I appreciate uh, your history with study of fibroids and endometriosis over the years. And uh, we look forward to seeing the next evolution of this. And thank you so very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today for this powerful and enlightening program. If you would like to join us in our efforts to support fibroid research, please visit our website, fibroidfoundation.org, and click on the research tab. If you're facing a menstrual health challenge, you don't have to make that journey alone. We encourage you to reach out to us to join a chapter near you, start a chapter, or just get general information. We look forward to seeing you again for the second day of Fibroid Summit 2023, Focus on Research. We strive to continue to share informative and enlightening research with you. Your input helps the research process tremendously. Together, we're making a difference. Thank you and be well.